Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's a microphone here and there's another here. Um, so if you've got questions for Eric, come down and make your way down to the microphone. Let me get the ball rolling. Um, okay. I guess the issue is, does it matter? Um, right. And I guess the issue there is how able to absorb a great deal of this kind of religious difference are our political institutions in the democratic West. Right. Yeah, uh, I mean, a very good question, of course, and a question that occupies us now because we have issues uh, such as the headscarf, the burqa, uh, the cartoons controversy emerging now. And, you know, I think we are able to absorb it currently. Uh, we are able to deal with it partly because it's still a small phenomenon. Uh, but as the pheno phenomenon grows, what are we going to do? I mean, what is Israel going to do when a majority of its population is ultra-Orthodox? Um, it's trying to integrate the ultra-Orthodox into the mainstream of society. It's not clear that it's going to succeed in doing so, and it's not clear that's going to bring birth rates down. So I do think that at some point there's a, a danger that if a group grows too large, uh, if you accommodate an illiberal group, then your society becomes illiberal. It isn't one of the issues about a group like the ultra-Orthodox in Israel. Yeah. Um, but e equally, a group like the Amish, say, in the United right, States, uh, that they're radically world-denying groups. Um, existentially, they can't be the mainstream. They reject the mainstream. Even, right. th there's even a problem when they become <laughs> demographically more important. They're existentially unable to take up that role because they reject right. it by definition. Yeah, I mean, and I, I see what you're saying, that the groups may be quietest, and therefore they're not going to get active in politics and take over as the majority, I think is what you're, what you're driving at. And I think that while it may look that way, for most of these groups, even if they started off as quietist and withdrawing from society, uh, many, most of them will avail themselves of politics when it suits them. So if you look at the Shia in Iran, for many hundreds of years, they had nothing to do with politics. They were quiet. Um, and then all of a sudden, in the, in the 1960s, you have the Iranian Revolution, a blend of you know, Marxist politics with traditional Shia uh, Islam. Uh, similarly with the religious right, for many years people thought, oh, white evangelicals, they're sleepy, they don't vote, they don't get involved. Now they're getting more involved than the average American. So I think these things can tip. I think it's the same with the Salafists. Uh, there's a great debate in Europe, can we use uh, Salafism to woo uh, to woo young radicals away from jihadism. So we'll, we'll, they can keep their fundamentalism, but just don't want to blow things up, actually just be fundamental about the Quran and withdraw. Uh, but actually, I don't think that, separa that neat separation can be maintained, because in both, case, both cases, you have an absolutist, totalizing worldview. Uh, and so you can tip easily from one to the other. Let's start with a question over here. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Eric, thank you for all your presentation. Is there a conflict between classical democratic theory and the toleration of both the secular and the uh, faith communities. Is it possible to have a majority that is very faith-driven and yet be tolerant? It's possible, <laughs> in theory. Uh, <laughs> if they've got the majority, Yes. Isn't that democracy, though? It is democracy. You're absolutely right. So, so if, if it's democracy and you have uh, strong religious fundamentalist groups that become the majority, that's right. They can impose their policies on abortion, on, for example, or, or, or other things. Now, the question is whether they will then abridge fundamental liberties. Uh, if they respect fundamental liberties, at least in theory, the secular population can get on with its own life without hindrance. However, if we're to look practically at the record uh, of fundamentalists when they do acquire a bit of power, it's not a very encouraging one. Um, even in the United States, the way that the religious right uh, has been able to affect people's access to abortion, for example, uh, um, you know, I think is a good indication of that, that it may be very difficult for them to resist getting their paws on uh, all of societies, but I, I, I do think that in theory you're correct, that there's not, you know, it is potentially possible to have a society that's dominated by religious fundamentalism, but where seculars are allowed more or less to have freedoms. So in some countries like Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, you know, Westerners have some 
have more freedoms than the rest of the population to, uh, you know, to maybe to consume alcohol, for example. Uh, you know, that might be possible, but I still think it's a difficult situation and not a desirable state of affairs. Um, Over here. Hi, Eric. Uh, Hi. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Firstly, I'd just like to say, um, you mentioned that you believe that Fukuyama's characterization of the end of history was hubristic. And That's me, said, actually. Ah, right. I agree, so I agree though. Yeah. I apologize. <laughs> Um, but, and Sam Huntington came up as well. He's been criticised as not necessarily just being overstated, but also perhaps morally ambiguous, because uh, the possibility of a self-fulfilling prophecy arises when you talk about a clash of civilizations. Um, I'd like to ask how you justify your theory, given your attempt to go past a merely academic audience and appeal to the general population. You, and, um, do you believe that your book may encourage and justify fear and suspicion between both the religious and the secular and between different religions? And also that it may encourage perhaps fear of immigration based upon your, I mean, there's already enough problems in this country trying to combat an aging population. The, thing, the kind of things which you mentioned might then have implications for yeah, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's a very good question and a big question. I th I'd say to begin with, my book is very largely about, ultimately about differences within ethnic groups, much more so than between them. So it's not so much a book about ethnic politics, which actually happens to be my academic background, more nationalism, ethnic politics. However, it's about differences between fundamentalist, moderate, secular, within a particular ethnic group, let's say a Muslim group, a, a Jewish, a Christian group. Now, it's not only about that, but ultimately that's what I'm talking about. So I'm not sure it actually has a lot to say specifically about ethnic issues in immigration. That is, you can be, you know, uh, a moderate Muslim from the Middle East who immigrates to Canada or, or wherever. And it's um, not about that. It's not about that. And in fact, actually, some of the strongest opponents of fundamentalism are coming actually from the moderate wings of these faith traditions. Um, and so, it, particularly in France, you can see there's a very clear, sharp split, depending on where you're, if you worship at the Paris Mosque, you are moderate, and you, you don't want anything to do with the burqa. In fact, you'll vote many French Muslims, I think a majority, but many of them actually are in favor of banning the burqa. So you actually, the, these divides are not strictly between, say, Muslim, Christian, Jew. And similarly with, with the family size issue, the, the differences in family size between say, Christians and Muslims. If you look at Europe and the Muslim population of Europe, its family size is converging very quickly to that of the host population. However, within... So, so the birth rates... The birth Muslims rates... Muslims in Europe are declining. Muslims are declining very fast. So it's, and just as the Catholic, the famous Catholic birth rate fell to Protestant uh, mainstream levels. So those differences between faith traditions and groups are kind of converging at the same time as the differences within are expanding. Now... You, you raise a valid point about immigration and multiculturalism. Now, I think depends, multiculturalism is, is a word you can read just about anything into. If multiculturalism means we must tolerate the intolerant, no matter how large, I am actually opposed to that. Um, so I think that kind of philosophy that says we must accord respect to any belief, I, I'm afraid I agree with Hitchens and Dawkins on that one. I'm just not going to respect uh, a very fundamentalist belief that violates things I believe in. Or tolerating parallel bubble worlds, perhaps, right. with people living in completely separate... Yeah. I mean, worlds. I don't think... That doesn't mean we should be paranoid and start thinking... So, for example, people think that Muslims in Europe are self-segregating themselves when actually close research shows they're actually not. Um, so we can't be paranoid. We have to be objective about this. But at the same time, I don't think we can simply say we're not going to criticize multiculturalism at all. Uh, I think we have to look at it in a very... Uh, Sorry, then Objective how would you way. Um, recommend that Western countries do combat their aging population? Aging population? Well, again, you, you're going to have immigration. But actually, I'm not sure, incidentally, this question of the aging population brings up demography. And obviously, I can go on about demography for a long time, but immigration is not actually a silver bullet for the aging problem. So, so if you think about... Um, nor if you think about Korea, for example, it's been calculated that almost the entire world would have to move to Korea in order for it to maintain its current age structure. So we're going to have to deal with aging. Immigration is not going to actually save us from that problem. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be part of the, the answer. 
But I, don't, I think a society is well within its rights that if... I, I don't, incidentally, I don't think this immigration-driven religion is really going to be the big issue. I mean, the big issue that I'm talking about in the book is the long-term issue of polarization within societies, the sort of Israel, Israel type thing, because most of the immigrants who are religious are, come from a sort of traditional religious background rather than a radicalized religious background. You don't have a lot of Wahhabis flooding into uh, the West, for example. So that kind of traditional religion is not an issue. It's the sort of religious fundamentalist reaction against secularism, which is very often stronger amongst the native elements, such as the, the ultra-Orthodox would be a, a classic case of that. Over here. Yep. Thank you. You, uh, you kind of touched on my question with mentioning the burqa in France. Um, with you talking about polarization within countries, yeah. it seems that the banning the burqa in France is a secular reaction or reactionary, if I can use that word, response to immigration and the flow of new religions into the country or growth that they're, they're perceiving, perceiving. Do you think this is going to backfire? Banning the burqa is going to backfire in the increase more of the fundamentalist responses, or is it going to work as they seem to want it to? Uh, we do seem to be seeing um, Europeans putting down marker lines <laughs> saying, so far, but no further, but lately. Yeah, I'm, I don't think it's going to have a dramatic effect, to be honest, uh, either way. Um, the banning of the burqa, I mean, it's worth, by the way, mentioning that there are many French Muslims who favor this policy as well. It's not, I wouldn't read it strictly as a we hate immigrants, nativist reaction. And it's certainly that too. Wait, well, yes, but yeah, are they the yeah. families that are having 10 kids? Uh, the ones that have the burqas? Yeah. Well, they're having, well, yes, they would be having larger numbers of, of children. Yeah, but th that's why I'm asking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you mean, so are you asking, is it going to have a demographic effect? No, no, to, well, if... Over time, if this demographic change is happening, if the ultra-Orthodox of all the different religions are having more kids, if the secular response to obvious examples of ultra-Orthodox are uh, being stomped on, is that going to then make the ultra-Orthodox even more militant? If that's the... It could. If the, you know, this is a fine line. It's as difficult to say. I mean, I think if you had... The problem with liberalism is if it, if it really clamps down, it violates its own principles. But, uh, but as John Rawls writes, uh, prominent theorist of liberalism, he says that liberalism does have an obligation to protect itself if the system is threatened by an illiberal group. Uh, but it should endeavor wherever possible to allow these illiberal groups to, to exist within it. Um, now, I, I clearly don't think that burqa wearers who number in maybe a thousand or just a small number are a threat. Um, to French society, but I also believe that, and the other thing I think about the burqa is that this is a, a symbolic issue. So it's partly about make a, making a symbolic statement that you know France is a secular republic, and so on and so forth, and it's also partly about politics. It's partly about Sarkozy um, trying to take the wind out of the sails of Le Pen. So I think these things, perhaps too much is read into them. I don't actually believe that banning the burqa is going to lead to a huge fury. Uh, or, or a huge revival, I don't think it's going to lead to the elimination either. I think it's partly a very symbolic exercise. I've just been, I've yeah. just recently made a program about Latin America, and I think Latin America raises some interesting questions right. for your picture. Um, you've suddenly got the rollout of gay marriage in Argentina and Mexico and Colombia and Uruguay and gay adoption and drug law reform and right. you know, all kinds of liberalising um, activity going on. Um, at a time when arguably there's a religious revival going on, but it also, I guess, um, asks, a, you know, throws a question in, in the, you know, we've got, had this picture that demographically the Christian world is going to shift to the south and, and it's, right. you know, it's going to be very much, Catholicism is going to be very much, you know, it's centred on Latin America, for example, right. or Africa or wherever, right. and, and yet... In a place like Latin America, we're getting a whole lot of different things happening all at the same time. Right, yeah. I mean, there's an important, I think, distinction to make between types of fundamentalism, if you like. Or, to, you know, by fundamentalism, I'm talking about religions uh, that take a literalist approach to the text. And, and I think there's a, a great difference between, for example, Pentecostalism, which, or, or the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, who are growing through conversion, but also losing heavily because 
They make new members, but they also lose many. So there's rapid turnover. Same with the Seventh-day Adventists. These sorts of religions which are based on uh, evangelicalism and conversion are not so much the model that I'm talking about. The model that I'm talking about are groups that are not really growing by conversion. They're walling themselves off endogenously and growing their own. And I think the, the, the movements you talk about in Latin America are either... Ah, the, movements uh, of that kind. They're not. They're either the established church or they're Pentecostalism. I would also add these things can go different ways. So, for example, in Africa, there have been more and more moves to restrict gay rights rather than open it up. So it just depends on the context. We're almost out of time, but we, we, we're allowed to run over by a few minutes, I've been told. But let's have a, have a question from this mic. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you on that talk. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. And I don't know whether you realise it, but here in Sydney we have one of the most fundamentalist um, expressions of Anglicanism in the world. And yet Australia is also <laughs> the most, or was, the most highly secularised country where theology was actually not allowed to be taught into the universities. And that that is, of course, getting whittled away. Um, my, my horror, my um, upset about the whole thing is where will it leave women? Because, and where will it leave science? Because for me, it means going back to a time when women were breeders, when they were seen within um, only being secular and raising children, and where their capacity to be equal to men, to have a brain, to be able to wield power, etc., is going to go underground again. Uh, your comments, please. Yeah, I think... <laughs> Uh, I absolutely agree with you that, and, and this is why, in a way, when some people say, well, we have to tolerate illiberal movements, and I agree with that. I mean, I think there's a real challenge for liberalism here, but I don't think we should automatically take that multicultural view that we have to tolerate it just because it's different. Um, and, and also, with regard to Islam, you know, people say, oh, well, uh, Saudi Arabia, let's let them do what they want. Women have to, you'd, all the women here would have to be in a separate lecture hall, perhaps, because you don't want to be tempted by a man, right? Uh, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there is that, that cultural side, which people forget. They say, well, we're not, you know, the Islamists aren't succeeding, they're failed, they're not taking power in any of these states. But actually, culturally, we have to ask the question, culturally, what's happening? What's happening to the rights of women, homosexuals, minorities? Actually, those rights are being curtailed. I mean, you can't as you say, women are being encouraged um, to stay in the home and have children. So that's, I think that's one of the great perhaps uh, tragedies. Why, perhaps this is why um, the phenomenon of women wearing the burqa on Western university campuses actually matters. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I'd agree with you. Last question, perhaps. Yep. Um, I want to talk about uh, the difference between religions, uh, namely Christianity and Islam. Um, you talked about Proposition 8. Um, right. it, it, passed, uh, it, uh, it was passed in 2000, year 2000, with 61% of the population. Yet in 2008, it passed by 58. Uh, sorry, yeah, 52%. So there's a huge change happening um, right in America. In, even if they, a lot of people call themselves Orthodox um, Christians or like hardcore Christians, there's a lot of shift happening even in the Western or Southern America and acceptance of gays and women are becoming more prevalent. Right, right. What, while um, in there's, Islamic, been a, there's been a very rapid shift in favor yeah, of gay marriage lot, in the United States, but, in public opinion. Yes, but as an Iranian um, who is actually an atheist, um, I have seen a lot of Muslim girls my age who are um, are very accepting accepting of really hardcore Sharia laws like um, cutting off hands, um, stoning, and a lot of really scary stuff. And it's happening actually. I study at the University of New South Wales, and I see a lot of girls um, are becoming more and more religious. I actually had lost a friend because of it. So. Um, yeah. I see. I think there is a difference between religions and. I think you. Yeah, I think you're correct. I'm trying to. You know, there are two very good questions. So the first question regards uh, support uh, for gay rights, and it is true that younger Americans 
uh, are more supportive of gay rights. Now, it's been said that young evangelicals in the U.S. Uh, are increasingly supportive of gay rights. There's some evidence to support that, but it's still a matter of debate, and the evidence is not clear. Some would argue that actually you're getting a polarization so that what's happening amongst young, particularly white Americans, is there is an increase in secularism, actually, in the United States, which is traditionally a very religious country, amongst young white Americans. Uh, but amongst those evangelicals, the evidence is not clear that the evangelicals are becoming more tolerant of homosexuality. But I, but I think so. There is a you know, we have to watch, again, we're going to have to watch how this one plays out. The other thing, too, is California is, after all, one of the most liberal uh, states in the U.S., as I said, votes mainly Democratic. But I, I want to address also this point about, about in Islam, where we see the phenomenon of children uh, being much more conservative than their parents. The parents wore miniskirts, or the mums wore miniskirts, uh, and the, the children uh, are covered up. So this phenomenon of the Islamic revival... Clearly, in the, in the cases you're describing, that's a cultural phenomenon where the idea uh, of Islam is becoming more accepted culturally. It's not a demographic phenomenon. I, I would say that the demography, uh, the de demography fed into the success of that movement post-1970, which is now sweeping through the Muslim world. And so it's now got some ideological impetus behind it. But what, what you're talking about there is not strictly, I guess, a demographic force, but it is definitely going on. People who think, again, many of us have this view that kids are always more liberal than their parents. Well, no, actually, let's go to Cairo and let's look at the cases um, where, in, in many cases, in many more cases than the other, the children are more conservative, more religious than the parents. So. I am going to have to wind it up there because we've gone about six or seven minutes over. Please thank Eric Kaufman. Thanks.